Rainier Arms brings you this episode of the QA. It is the end of the month, which means it is time for the QA. It is the March 2020 edition of the QA. My name is Dave Tim from Guns and Tactics. Thank you guys very much for watching. If you want to see your question get on the show, the best way to do so is to email me. Email address is shown below. That is the QA at gunsandtactics.com. Please email me your questions. You can leave comments below. I love reading comments. I love interacting with viewers or whatever, but the easiest way for me to keep track of all the questions and put them in one place is to email. So please email the questions. That would be the best. Email, 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 and then you can see your question on the show. And as you'll see towards the end, one lucky question asker gets a cool prize. Now, before we get into the questions, and believe me, we have a lot, I do want to kind of get real for a minute. It is March 2020, so if you're watching this right around that time, you know what's going on, current events. If you're watching this into the future, coming back in time, it is kind of a unique and weird time. Uh, right now, Minnesota is, which is where I'm filming this right now, uh, is in our shelter in place executive order. That's going on all around the country. We're seeing COVID-19 and the coronavirus take over all sorts of different aspects of our lives all over the world. And no matter where you're from, what race you are, what religion you are, what income, rural, urban, whatever, this is gonna affect us all. And there's a very good chance that it's going to impact either someone in your family, someone you know, or maybe even you. And quite frankly, it's, it's kind of interesting. So I, first off, I hope all of you guys that watch are doing okay. I hope you guys are staying healthy and I hope you guys are doing well. I truly do appreciate my QA viewers. I've said it before, I'll say it again. You guys, I feel like really are kind of the inner circle. I let my hair down the most with you guys. Uh, just because I feel like you guys are the most regular watchers, you're the most sincere watchers, and if I was able to see a statistic, you're probably the most engaged and you watch the whole video. Uh, I know some of you guys like to listen to this like a podcast or uh, tune in, so I sincerely do appreciate it. And I mean this, I hope you guys are doing okay. Uh, <clears throat> I was going to joke that this month's prize was either going to be your choice of hand sanitizer or toilet paper. Uh, and I can still make that happen if you prefer. Otherwise, I do have a prize from Rainier Arms, which we'll get to later. But thank you to them for sponsoring the show. So I hope you guys are doing okay, coronavirus. Uh, I know it's weird. Uh, for the first time in my adult life, I went to the stores and I saw bare shelves and it was weird. Uh, I don't live in a hurricane area or anything like that. Now, occasionally when we get a blizzard or a severe winter storm, yeah, people will go stock up, but it was nothing like this. And I'm sure this echoes the exact same views that you guys had at your stores all the way around the country or maybe even around the world. Uh, go ahead and feel free to post down below what your experiences are. But even after 9-11, uh, I was a college student. I was in, you know, what for lack of a better term, what my state calls the police academy, even though it's through the college system. Uh, I was in the academy, if you will, at the time. And even during and after 9-11, I didn't really worry about going to the grocery store. But after this, uh, and I take pride in, in being a little prepared. I have that peace of mind, so I'm not worried about my family starving or anything. But, you know, it kind of made me think, maybe, you know, do we have enough food to get through a couple weeks? And uh, it it's an interesting time. So I hope all of you guys are doing well. I hope you guys get through this. Uh, I feel like we will get through this as a country. We're going to be stronger, but I have a feeling it's going to be probably a rough few weeks. Uh, kids are having to be home all over the country. They're doing distance learning and things like that. And uh, it, it's just, it's, yeah, maybe we'll do a separate kind of QA or just kind of an off topic video on Corona on my mind or something like that. I don't know. But if you guys want to talk more or vent or have an off-topic video, something like that, leave a comment down below as well. Uh, we have a lot of questions, and I mean a lot. We have YouTube comments. I got emails. I got messages. Uh, this is probably the most. In fact, I don't even have them organized like I normally do because there are so many, so I'm going to be keeping tally. Now, because of that, I don't want this video to get super obnoxiously long because those of you guys that know me know that I like to answer questions thoroughly and give you guys good info, but I also know that that can make for a very long-winded video. So I might be a little bit more terse or pithy with my answers, but if you guys need some more follow-up, don't be afraid to leave a comment below and maybe that could turn into a video of itself. So. First comment actually was from View at Your Own Risk on YouTube. Dave Tim coming from you live from a Borg cube. And I had no idea what a Borg cube was, but because of the green background, uh, it's a, oh shoot, is it Star Wars or Star Trek? I think it's Star Trek that I had to go Google what it was, but he was happy that people went and searched for that. So there we go. All right, here we go. This is from DT, DTKMRP, question for next time. What are the most common failure points 
of the AR platform and what backup spare parts would you recommend having on hand? Uh, I would say most common failure points are probably some of the small parts like springs and rings, things like that. So gas rings, I do have a video on gas rings. I'll put a link up in uh, the description. Excuse me, I'll put a link up here on the card where you can check that out. It's kind of gas ring 101 and it talks about how to check your gas rings, how to change your gas rings. But those are kind of a, a wear item. So you should have some of those little springs also in the AR, extractor springs, ejector springs, sometimes fire control group springs, those are all springs so they can break, they can wear out over time. Magazines, including magazine springs. Magazines are a perishable item. I would say uh, most stoppages that I see from the AR are because of magazines getting damaged or improper care or people getting way too connected to their mags, meaning that they don't want to replace them. So that would probably be the number one failure point of the AR is generally magazine related. From there, it's lubrication or lack thereof. And then from there, as far as parts, yeah, I've seen extractors break. I have seen bolts break. Uh, so th stuff can happen. I've seen fire control group parts break. Uh, generally, if it's a good quality barrel, good quality receivers, those things just you know don't break too often, but that's something to keep an eye out for. So what I would recommend having as spare parts is if you can have a spare bolt assembly, spare rings, uh, extractor, extractor springs, some of those small parts, that would be good. Maybe I'll do a separate video on kind of a spare parts kit. That's a good idea. This question is from Thomas. AR-15s are great and with the endless options on ways to customize and make them better, it's easy to see why everybody has one. What is another rifle out there that offers the same endless options for customization? Great question. Uh, I would say there are a few rifles that have started out to become their own platform. And what I mean by that is when the AR-15, the Armalite 15 rifle was first, Armalite rifle 15 was first kind of made, it was made by Armalite, it was this rifle. Well, now it's kind of turned into its own platform where everybody's making stuff. Now, there are a few other guns that I do think can claim that platform status where they started out by a company as a gun and now they've turned into this platform where everybody makes parts accessories. Number one is the Remington 700 or bolt action type rifles. There are numerous actions out there that are clones of the 700 and improvements of the 700 that use 700 footprints that take 700 compatible triggers. So bolt action rifles that kind of clone the Remington 700 are endless like that where you can literally create a precision rifle from a very low budget to a very high budget. So that is a rifle that is endlessly creative, but I gotta warn you, precision rifle stuff is addicting and it is expensive, but it's a lot of fun. The Ruger 1022 is its own platform. When Ruger came out with the 1022, it was this great rifle, great rimfire rifle. Well, now you can get every single part to build a 1022 style rifle and not have a Ruger part. There's aftermarket actions, barrels, bolts, accessories, triggers, everything that make these high-end rifles truly high-end all the way to a off-the-shelf 1022. Uh, in some ways, some shotguns have kind of become that. There have been clones of like Remington 870s, things like that. There have been clones of other guns. Now in the handgun market, there's a, a few. Glock has kind of become its own platform now as well as 1911. But your question was specifically for what's another rifle. So that's my two answers that I'm going to go with right now is the Ruger 1022 platform as well as the Remington 700. And of course, the AK, I mean, that goes without saying. So that would be three. You can get an AK and do as much as you want to that as well. There's milled, there's stamped, and there's all sorts of different calibers now you can do. There's different barrel lengths and rails and triggers and sights and all sorts of stuff. So those are three. I'm gonna to stick to those three. This is from Rick. Uh, is an AR-15 10.5 inch barrel pistol a realistic option? I see so many for sale, but wonder if the decreased velocity, if it's really just more of a gimmick. I have a 14 and a half inch barrel with a 1.7 twist for CQB. Obviously, you're correct. You're gonna have decreased velocity. So if you're gonna use a SBR or a pistol, 10 and a half inch, 11 and a half inch, whatever, you wanna make sure that you're using ammunition that is designed to be shot in those barrels so that way it performs at a slower velocity. I believe we had a question like this similar uh, last month where we're talking about kind of pistols and stuff. Personally, for me, the shortest AR I would go with is a 10 and a half. I like 11 and a half inch better. You just generally get a little bit more reliability. You have a longer dwell time, which means the time that gas can build in the system. 
SBRs are just fine. 10 and a half inch, 11 and a half inch. I've used them on patrol. I've had one ready for like self-defense, home defense type situations. So I have zero issues with an SBR, especially if you're gonna add a suppressor, then the overall length doesn't get too long. So it is realistic. Again, just make sure you pick quality ammunition. Right now, as of this video, my favorite short barrel rifle round is the Gold Dot 75 grain. It's just, it, I find that it shoots really accurate. Uh, I got to test it a lot with Johan from Federal. We got to shoot it into gel. We got to do barrier tests, whatever, and I was really impressed with how it performed. So that's what I generally run in my 11 and a half inch guns and my 10 and a half inch guns, all the way up to about 16 inch guns. So it is realistic. Uh, it's not too bad at all. Another one from Rick. Um, with my astigmatism, I can't use a red dot. Do you know of any other option out there for handguns? I use magnified scopes on my AR. So with a red dot for your handgun, uh, I would probably, uh, right now I'm not aware of a handgun sight that has an etched reticle. So that is kind of the downside. Maybe check out a few different manufacturer red dots. I would say quality ones are going to be from Trijicon. The Holo Suns are actually really impressing me. The 509, which I did a first look video on, is uh, a great red dot. I'm really impressed with it so far. So maybe try those to see if they you know, like your eyes or your eyes like them a little bit better. Otherwise, I would then look at a quality set of sights, like a fiber optic sight, something with a fiber optic front sight, a nice black rear sight, so you can focus on that. Until something comes out with like an etched reticle or a holographic reticle or something that would work better with your eyes, that's what I would probably be going with. Great question. All right, just a couple of comments then to review. Uh, Seafair NH says, thanks for getting this film and you're so tired. Last month I was super tired when I filmed that, so I appreciate that. And then Aaron, I really like your videos, but please stop saying that you'll put a link up and then you point somewhere, usually right about here, and there's nothing there because I forgot to do it most of the time. Just say that people can look up the video in your collection or something like that. Well, there you go. People, look it up in my collection or something like that. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, sometimes what I'll do is I'll upload the video I'll have it go live and then I have to go back and add the cards, which generally are right up there. There's nothing here right now, Chris, okay, or Aaron, sorry, Erwin. I'm going to point here, but there's nothing there, so I don't want you to look. I'm just demonstrating. And then, yeah, sometimes I'll forget to go back right away and add it. I wish YouTube, when you uploaded it, you could say I want a card at this time and this time and this time, but there's not a way to do it. So, yes, I apologize. I'm not perfect. Not perfect. Just how it goes. Now, let's get to the email questions because, boom, there's a lot of them. All right, this next one is from Rob. Can you run through the basic steps for tuning an AR-15 with an adjustable gas block? I'm a little confused about the balance between gas adjustment and changing the buffer weight. Are there any other tuning factors to consider? Uh, those are the main ones. Spring, obviously, is another one you could get some of the uh, heavier springs on the market. Uh, obviously, ammo is gonna be a factor there because that's actually how much energy we are putting in the gun. Weather could be a little bit of a factor, lubrication, make sure it's lubed, and then obviously your gas port, which is fixed, so you can't really adjust that. Well, you can adjust that. You could drill it out or whatever, but most people, when they build the gun, they're going to pick the buffer and spring, and then they're going to adjust how to run the gun most commonly with the gas block. So here's what I would recommend. Uh, this is going to be a short video or question. I might do this as a separate video topic just so I can get a little more detailed. Assuming you have the gun built, you're not going to be swapping out buffers and springs. You just kind of want to get it tuned as it is built. First things first, load one round in the magazine. Load it, go to the range, fire. If it locks back, great. You know that you have enough energy to at least cycle the action back so the bolt locks back in an empty magazine. You could try then turning it down to see where that failure point is, and then you could increase the gas so you have a little bit of a buffer for reliability. Not to be confused with the real buffer, just a turn buffer. However, most times what's going to happen is it's probably not. So it's going to eject the round out, but maybe that bolt won't lock back to the rear. So you have to keep opening up the gas, increasing the gas until you have enough energy to do that. Now, we're also going to look at ejection pattern. Ideally, if we had a bird's eye view, that perfect ejection pattern would be about three to four o'clock. However, we also want to make sure that the ejection velocity is good. If the round just kind of piddles out, but it's at four o'clock, that doesn't mean that it's good. It's piddling out. We want a nice and it's not really gonna make that sound effect, but it's gonna have a nice arc, a good ejection velocity at that good three to four o'clock. And then obviously it should be cycling, locking back, should be feeding the next round, everything like that. So that is kind of it in a nutshell. I kind of skimmed over that. Uh, if you have a good quality gas block, you can also check with the instructions from the manufacturer on kind of where they recommend starting out and then slowly opening it up until you start to get that reliability for locking back. Once it locks back with one round, load two, pop, pop, should lock back on two, 
load it with three, one, two, three, it should lock back on three. Again, noting the ejection pattern, noting that the brass is nice, hopefully an ejecting a good distance away, five, six, eight feet, whatever. And it's also consistent. And then we wanna make sure that it runs with a variety of ammunition. And then also when you, if you were gonna add a suppressor, that keep in mind that's gonna increase the amount of gas left in the system. So it's probably gonna be a little more um, felt recoil and a little bit more ejection pattern. It's gonna you know, be going a little bit faster. The cyclic rate is gonna be going a little faster. So that is a great question and probably we'll do a separate video on that because I think it's a good topic. This next one is from Kevin. What are the most common failure points of the AR and what, oh, wait a minute, you sent an email and a comment. So Kevin, already got you covered, see before. All right, this one is from Robert. What precision rifle and scope would you recommend for someone who wants to try competitive rifle matches but isn't sure it is a competition he wants to do long term? What caliber would it be? Costs on ammunition? What training would you recommend? All my rifles are hunting. Honestly, if you're just kind of interested in starting out, go to a match. Go to a match. If you can, try to network with somebody beforehand and just say, hey, I am brand new to this. I want to try it out. Offer some cash, okay? And just say, does anyone have a spare rifle and ammunition I could use? I'm willing to pay for the ammunition. Can you help me out? And I guarantee you, with just about 98% certainty, that somebody will say, hey, Robert, come on out, I have a spare rifle. If you pay for my reloaded ammunition or pay for this factory ammunition that I prefer to run through it, you pay me for that, I will let you use the rifle in my ammo. Most people who shoot precision rifle are very picky about what ammunition goes through that rifle. For example, with my precision rifle, I only put Hornaday through that rifle. So if someone wanted to use it, I would make sure that they paid me for that ammunition or bought a very specific ammunition. I just wouldn't let them go to the five and dime and pick out whatever the cheapest of that caliber is because it's just not gonna happen. But I guarantee you someone will probably let you use a rifle, they'll take you under their wing and they'll kind of show you some ins and outs. You're gonna do horrible your first match. That's to be expected. I did horrible at my first matches. That's just how it goes, you're learning the ropes. And then if you decide to like it, then you can start to check out what's available Production class rifles are becoming more popular. Uh, if I guess if I had to pick a caliber for you, if you're gonna hold me to that, I would probably say 6.5 Creedmoor. It's readily available, it's accurate, it works out really well. How, I'm not saying it's the best round, but that's what I shoot. And there's rounds that are better, of course. Rounds that have better trajectory, rounds that have better velocity, rounds that are, have lower recoil. However, some of them are more expensive, some of them are really made to be reloaded. Uh, but just as a good out of the box, all around round, it's tough to beat 6.5 Creedmoor still. Uh, but yeah, like these newer rounds like 6 Creedmoor, 6 PRC, uh, Dasher, 260. I mean, there's a lot of great rounds out there, don't get me wrong. Uh, and as far as ongoing costs for ammunition, obviously if you reload, that'd be way cheaper. No problems there. Uh, however, if you don't have the time, there's good quality factory ammo. What training? Most clubs offer kind of like a new shooters clinic. I know in Minnesota we have one coming up in May, assuming that the whole corona thing is going to allow us to still meet and stuff and go from there. Otherwise, if you have a hunting rifle that works really well and you can hold 10 rounds or reload it quick, maybe just even try that. Most stages are limited to 10 rounds. That's a great question. But I would just recommend going, making some friends. People will help you out. We love to see new people get into the sport. All right, this next one is from Rusty. Break Muzzle brake or suppressor for long range shooting and why? Help me with the pros and cons of both. So a muzzle brake will obviously help break the recoil. It distributes the gas. It's similar to a compensator. There's a little bit of differences, which sometimes people use the terms interchangeably and whatever else. Uh, suppressors, however, is generally a sound suppressor. It might not reduce the recoil. Sometimes it might. However, it's a lot easier on your ears. Some people find that their rifles actually shoot better with the suppressor. Uh, they can control it, they just like it because it adds a little bit more weight to the gun. So they like the balance of it, they like the performance of it. As far as why, ultimately you're going to choose what you like the best. So if you're practicing a lot and you like having that sound signature reduced a little bit and the way you like the way your rifle shoots, then a lot of guys I know, they just shoot suppressor on all the time. Some guys like the muzzle brake, they want that that smooth shooting rifle has less of felt recoil and muzzle rise so they can see their rounds and call their own hits. The downside is it's a little bit more obnoxious to those around you, so it's not as friendly to those around you. So those are kind of some of the pros and cons. The biggest con with a suppressor is added cost and added time to get it. It's kind of a pain to get and it definitely are not cheap. A good quality suppressor and muzzle device to mount it to, or if you can get a direct thread one, that's fine too. 
uh, you're probably looking at about a thousand plus bucks. Just the way it goes, by the time you pay for your stamp, transfer fee, purchase fee, whatever it might be, you're looking at another $1,000. So that's probably the biggest con. The biggest pro is it doesn't hurt your ears as much. So as you're shooting alone, practicing, whatever, uh, you can you know, reduce the need for ear pro. So those are kind of some pros and cons. This is about the halfway point, so I am gonna give a shout out to Rainier Arms and the Apex Club for a low price of $99.99 a year. So just under $100, you get free ground shipping, exclusive discounts, and exclusive early access to all the cool stuff. Rainier Arms is constantly adding in new stuff, whether it's for handguns, whether it's for ARs, large frame ARs, precision rifle, shooting accessories, ammunition, whatever it might be, they're getting the cool stuff because they have great relationships in the industry. And as an Apex Club member, you get a discount, early access, and free ground shipping. It can easily pay for itself in this first couple of orders. It has all the benefits of your favorite online Prime shopping experience with your members only exclusive big box warehouse members only executive type membership, except for it's all the cool stuff from Rainier Arms. So thank you very much to Rainier Arms and the Apex Club. Check it out, $99.99 a year, just under $100, and you get all this goodness. This question is from Mike. I've worn my EDC guns AIWB professionally and on a regular basis. I know uh, they're not new, but what's your opinion of the clip draw, good, bad, or what? Keep up the good work, thank you very much. Uh, AIWB is appendix inside the waistband, which is a great way to carry, either inside the waistband or appendix inside the waistband. I recommend carrying with a good quality holster. Uh, the clip draw is like a, basically like a little pocket knife clip that goes to the slide or the frame of a gun and then you can put that in your pants. Here's the thing, unless you have a very specific need for that, I still generally prefer having the gun in a holster. Retention is better, it doesn't shift or move around as much, the trigger guard is protected, reholstering is safer. Uh, I, I just overall prefer a holster versus a clip draw. Now, do I know some guys in LE that have used the clip draw because they absolutely are working an assignment where they need a very specific certain concealability with a small gun? Yep, totally. Uh, and have there been times when people have used no holster because of a very specific situation? Yeah. Do I recommend it? No. If you can get by with wearing a good quality holster and conceal and have comfort and stability with that platform, I would highly recommend doing that. So I'm not saying the clip draw is a bad product at all. I'm just saying I prefer a holster. That's my opinion and I'm sticking to it. All right, this one is from... This one is from Paul. Uh, I recently built a very nice and somewhat expensive AR, 14 and a half inch Roscoe barrel, uh, pinned and welded. One day I saw the range officer, about a week later I picked it up and noticed the muzzle brake was not pushing tight or crushing the crush washer. I don't think he's ever done it. For the sake of making it uncomfortable, uh, I'm going to handle it. What is the best way to remove the muzzle device without damaging the barrel? So assuming, uh, basically his question is he had somebody pin and weld it and he didn't think they did a good job and he needs to remove it. How I remove pin and welded muzzle devices is I put the barrel on my milling machine, I use an end mill, and I mill off the weld. Um, most times, if it's done good, I can mill off the weld and I can remove the pin and then I can remove the muzzle device. Sometimes I end up having to remove more material because of how it was done or whatever, and sometimes the muzzle device is not reusable. Sometimes it is. Sometimes I can just machine off the weld I can take out the pin and then it left me with enough material where I can even make a new pin and re-weld that pin in place. So that's that. Uh, hopefully it's not damaged. Hopefully the drilling uh, didn't go too deep. It didn't you know, mess up any of the threads or anything like that. But I would find a good quality gunsmith or machinist in your area with a milling machine. I would not recommend using a Dremel tool because it's easy to slip and damage the barrel, damage the muzzle device, whatever, and that, that sucks. So that's how I do it. I just use a, uh, I think it's an eighth inch end mill and I can be very precise with it and I can machine off what I need to machine off, expose that pin. Uh, then depending on how it, it fit in there, a little bit of coil, a little bit of heat, if I can access that and usually the pin will tap out and uh, I can go from there. So that's how I do it. This one is from Sean. What is your preferred optic reticle for precision shooting competition? Do you know uh, okay, first off, I'm going to preface with this. I am by no means an expert precision rifle shooter. So my opinion is still that of a new precision rifle shooter. I consider myself a noob uh, when it comes to precision rifle shooting, okay? So I just want you to be clear on that. Do you prefer to dope your scope or just use holdovers? I want to get into long range known distance competitions. 
Uh, the primary arm scope looks good. I have $600 for some glass. I want to get it right the first time. And then his another question is, what's your favorite length for general purpose when running a can? I want to build the ultimate mini recce rifle leaning towards a 13 and a half, 12 and a half. And uh, then he wants to keep it compact. TR24, one to four with a red triangle. You should go green. I like the green triangle. First question, preferred optic or reticle? It depends, man. Everybody likes different things. When I first got into precision rifle shooting, I thought just simple was good. So I have like tactical milling type reticles where it's like a mill dot but with lines instead and I, it was just like a crosshair and I thought that was good. Then once I first started to see Christmas tree reticles which are basically they have marks that kind of go down in a Christmas tree I was like oh those look pretty cool. So some of the Christmas tree reticles that are out there start out like this and they kind of taper it's like I'm not going to need to hold here I'm going to need to hold here with wind so I like the Christmas tree you know that are more like this. So more like a, uh, a balsam pine or versus a Fraser fir, if you know anything about pine trees. I used to sell Christmas trees when I was a Boy Scout. Anyways, uh, that's what I would look at. I like the Christmas tree type reticles, and there's a lot of good companies, uh, depending on what you can look at. Now, as far as $600, um, I would, I'm going to start to try to do some more research on some of that price point. If you can save up a little bit more money, I think there's a lot of really good things to look at. However, for around that $600 price point, you might be able to start to look at like maybe a used Miopta uh, optic, which are really cool. Vortex does have some options in that price range. Maybe you can look at some of the Bushnell, Burris, um, the Brownells line of scopes. I think it's gonna be a little bit more money. They're gonna be closer to a thousand bucks, but you can maybe even find something uh, that's maybe a little bit dinged up on the outside used. That's a good quality optic, that's still great optically, but was just used for a season or two and shows a little bit of wear and you can save some money. So that might be something to look at. Uh, hope that makes sense. Now, as far as prefer to dope your scope or use your holdovers, honestly, it kind of depends on the very few matches I've shot. It really kind of depends on the target size, how stable I am, how quick I need to be. Uh, if I can feel comfortable, I might just hold over, hold over, and then if I know I have to dial for that one or whatever, I might do that. Otherwise, I might dial. Some of it is gonna kinda depend if I have to dial back and forth, or whatever. And again, I'm new. I've only shot a couple of matches. Um, I'm still learning, but that's what I see a lot of the people that have kinda taken me under their wing, is they just kinda figure it out stage by stage. So if they know that it's a huge target, huge target, and they can just hold and hold and hold and feel comfortable with that, they'll do it. Whereas if they have to get more precise, then they'll generally dial if they have enough time. If you're gonna be wasting a lot of time getting in and out of awkward positions, taking up support, repositioning your bags or whatever, it might be quicker for you to hold. However, if you have the time, you might be able to be uh, more precise by dialing. So I hope that answers that part. Favorite barrel length for general purpose? Um, I would say right now my general purpose rifles are my Sweet 16s. Uh, I'll put Irwin, yes, I will put a card up there, Irwin, for the Sweet 16 rifle. And that is a 13.9 inch or 13.7 inch barrel with the muzzle device pinned and welded. So that way I don't have to register it as an SBR and it's right at 16 inches. So as a, far as a do-all, great gun, no NFA required except for the suppressor, I like that. However, if I was doing a mini recce and you're okay with an SBR, 12 and a half inch, that's a good barrel length. I, I have no hesitations doing that. By the time you add a muzzle device to that, it's gonna add a little bit of length. By the time you add your 4.7 inch uh, overall length, you know, let's just call it five inches uh, to a 12 and a half inch, you're gonna be at you know, 17 and a half ish or so inches, which is what a 16 inch gun with a muzzle device would be, a longer muzzle device would be anyway. So it's not unreasonable with a suppressor. Uh, my sweet 16 with a suppressor is probably closer to like that 18, 19 inch barrel length, give or take. So something to consider there. But yeah, I think that's a very good, reasonable thing. 12 and a half inch, 13 inch, awesome stuff. All right, a few more. This one is from, uh, I don't know if it's Steven or Stefan. I apologize, I think it's Stefan. Stefan, hey Dave, big fan. Wondering if there's a difference between bolt gun scopes and AR scopes. I'd also love a video breaking down scopes in general. Uh, yeah, I can probably make a video on that. I think that's a good idea. So generally speaking, AR scopes mostly are going to be LPVOs, like a one to four, a one to five, a one to six, although now they even have one to eights and one to tens. But generally with an AR, a do-all type rifle, you're probably gonna be looking for that low end so you can use the rifle quick and fast for up close targets, but then you have some magnification to get you out to about that 400-ish yard range, which in my opinion for an AR with 223, 
most of the time, realistically, it's maximum effective range, realistic effective range, that's a better term. Realistic effective range is about that three to 400 yards. Yes, I know. Somebody that you know has been to wherever and they have shot at whoever at six or 800 yards away or whatever. They probably shot at people, I'll give them that. But when I talk to other people who've been over there who were marksmen or who whatever, basically say, yeah, it's the wind, the ballistic efficiency, the energy carried, it's not really meant to be a five, six, 800 yard gun. It just wasn't meant to be that. Additionally, when I've done extended range shooting and training, whether it be in competition or training or whatever, you'll be shooting at 600 yards and you'll be like, yeah, impact, impact. And then all of a sudden the round will be like six feet to the right because of the wind gust. So shooting two, two threes at super long ranges is a challenge. Now, that being said, bolt gun scopes, AR scopes. Most of my bolt gun scopes are a higher magnification, so generally I prefer a front focal plane and they have adjustable ballistic knobs. On my ARs, I want generally a second focal plane if it's like a one to four, one to five, because I'm only gonna be using a ballistic reticle or compensating reticle at maximum magnification anyway. And then I want something that's gonna be bright so I can pick it up fast like a red dot I want capped turret so it's not gonna get bumped or snagged on gear and lose my adjustment or anything like that. So that's kind of my, my difference with that. Uh, generally, I also want it to be lighter weight on an AR because it's probably gonna be something I'm patrolling with or whatever, whereas a precision rifle or a bolt gun, I can probably have a bipod or support. So, But I think your idea of a scope video is kind of a good, good idea. I might look into that. All right, almost done, guys. This is the last one. This is from Bob. Uh, Bob is a regular viewer, so good to hear from you, Bob. I've included an audio file. Maybe this is something new. So he's actually sending his question via audio. I want to thank you for your channel and everything you do and taking the time out to answer all of our questions. You're very welcome. Um, I'd also like to reach out and thank Jeff over at Miles Tactical. Um, he did a fantastic job uh, putting the uh, Cerakote on my very old Winchester one, Model 190-22. Turned out great. Um, your recommendation was fantastic. Good to hear. Um, as for my question, I'd like to know your thoughts on compensators, such as, like for an AR, is there too much of a compensator? Um, I happen to have McCulloch's um, compensator on mine, mm -hmm. and it really decreased the amount of uh, kickback on the gun. Thanks again. No, thank you for the question. I kind of like having the audio. It kind of makes me feel like I am that radio DJ. Um, so I'm going to put some pictures that you guys have already seen. I thought the gun turned out really good. Jeff is uh, my service that I use for Cerakote. I was doing Cerakote myself. I um, found that Jeff does a way better job, and he's a good guy, and he does really good work. So he's actually not too far from me, and I anything that comes in my shop that is going to be Cerakoted goes to Jeff. Otherwise, I refer people direct. So... He does great work and I think this gun turned out awesome. Now, as far as your question, uh, is there too much of a compensator? Well, it kind of depends. Are you shooting with someone? Are you shooting indoors? Are you gonna be shooting in a vehicle? That's when compensators really start to become obnoxious. If you're just shooting yourself at the range, with, if you're shooting yourself, oh boy. If you're just shooting by yourself at the range, practicing or maybe competing uh, where no one's immediately around you, Having a really effective compensator that really, you know, diverts all this huge blast and gas to the sides and around you, whatever, it's not going to bother anybody, and that's okay. However, where compensators or muzzle brakes can become an issue is when you start to maybe go to a class and you're going to have people shooting near you on a line, then it's really annoying for them. And that's kind of uh, one of those things that I used to tell students uh, when I was teaching more classes was... For this class, do not have an obnoxious compensator. If, if you do, we're going to put you way on the end so you're not bothering anybody because it sucks to shoot next to somebody with a comp. Like, I swear it feels like your fillings come loose. So that's that aspect. Additionally, for home defense, inside shooting, inside a vehicle or whatever, all of that is just going to be like right in your face and you're going to feel it and you're going to hear it and it's not as comfortable versus open spaces. Now with three gun, I used to shoot a very effective compensator and when we had to shoot inside barrels or ports or buildings or vehicles, even with ear pro, you can definitely feel the comp more and that was kind of annoying. But that's kind of the trade-off. I mean, you're getting that performance of the comp, the energy has to go somewhere and that's just kind of how they work. Uh, so. 
One aspect could be you get a compensator and then you get a suppressor to go over it. No, I'm just kidding, that's not the easiest thing. But the Michelin comp is a great comp. It's relatively inexpensive and it performs just really well overall. So if it doesn't bother you and it's not bothering those that you are uh, shooting with or training with or whatever, I say keep running it. But yeah, is there too much of a good thing? There certainly could be. So with that, that was, I think, the most questions we've ever gotten, guys. I think that was the record. And according to my math, we have... Well, maybe not the most. We have 11? I feel like there was more. Anyways, let me go ahead and pick a random number between 1 and 11. So we had 11 questions. Oh my gosh. And it's really 11? 11. That's what it says. 11, which is Bob with his audio question. Uh, so, Bob, I do give you... Uh, Definitely the E for effort for sending the audio, which was actually pretty cool. Uh, and now you get to be a prize winner as well. Guys, if you want to see your question on the show, the best way is to email us. Email address is shown below, the QA guns and tactics.com. Send me your emails. Uh, if you want to leave comments, that's great. It's easier for me to get the email because it goes into the inbox and I can add it to the show. Even if you have other questions, if you have a comment or whatever, feedback, you can totally email me. That's just fine. Now, Real quick, before we wrap this video up, the 50K giveaway. You guys are my inner circle. I'm really counting on you to share, okay? We're at 44 plus thousand subscribers. Obviously, that means I have six more thousand to go. We're gonna be doing a giveaway. I'm trying to work with companies and manufacturers and stuff to actually get a pretty good prize pack that we're gonna be giving away several prizes to various people. But I can't do that if we don't get to 50,000 subscribers on YouTube. So I need your help. If you're part of the social media groups, if you have shooting friends or whatever, please tell them to check it out, subscribe. I try to put out really good info that I think shooters would be interested in watching, but I need your help to get that out there so I can have a 50K giveaway and my goal is to do it in 2020. So I need your help. Please like, share, and subscribe. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Again, send the questions to the email address that was previously mentioned, theqagunstactics.com. Please like, share, and subscribe. Thank you very much for watching, and I wish you happy health and good safety. Thanks for watching, and have a great day. We work really hard to make content that we hope you as a shooter would enjoy. Subscribe to our channel, check out our featured videos and playlists, and if you have a question firearms related, go ahead and send an email to the address shown on the screen to be entered into our monthly QA series.